You can cut it out for all I care, but you leave my girls alone. Let them go. Take me. We'll take all of you. 10 underrated Blumhouse horror movies that deserve your attention. While talking about movies, viewers and critics often don't discuss the business aspect of movie making. A well-made film can be attributed to the producers who identify storytellers' creative and innovative concepts, bringing them to the spotlight. We are talking about an entertainment entrepreneur who transformed a horror experiment worth $15,000 to $193 million at the box office, accompanied by many successful sequels. You guessed right. We are talking about Jason Blum, founder of Blumhouse Productions. He has created his place in the micro-budget filmmaking world since the release of Paranormal Activity. For decades, Blum has developed profitable film franchises that are campy, delightful, and daring. In many ways, his career shares similarities to arguably the greatest pop cinema pantheon tycoon, Roger Corman. This video brings you 10 underrated Blumhouse productions that deserve more attention. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Help us! The Green Inferno 2013. In New York City, a college student named Justine joins a group of activists led by Alejandro. They travel to Peru to protest against a timber industry that is destroying the Amazon rainforest. When the group returns to civilization, their plane blows up and crashes into the forest. Soon, the survivors discover that they are not alone and are in for a huge shock. For anyone familiar with the Hostel trilogy, director Eli Roth collaborates with Blumhouse Production in The Green Inferno. This film is a dopey homage to the infamously unappetizing subgenre of grindhouse films. Its prolonged path to the theater worked in favor of Roth since he had been absent from the director's chair since 2007. It is a gore galore of cannibalism and the occasional humor. The drawing card of this film that appeals to most horror buffs is its exotic, dangerous location. It has sufficient promise for multiple gory sequels, according to Roth. It has grisly makeup effects that are created by none other than legends Gregory Nicotero and Howard Berger. The squishy, screaming dismemberment that sets the ball rolling for this film is all thanks to them. As far as cannibalism movies are concerned, The Green Inferno portrays some of the best special effects to date. Between one captive experiencing bouts of explosive diarrhea ugh, and a corpse with a bag of weed, it looks like Eli Roth drew his inspiration from Cheech and Chong. Overall, Roth gives this film the right veneer of authenticity that it requires, while also borrowing inspiration for its title from Ruggiero Diodato's Cannibal Holocaust. They want to see how we'll react to this bullshit. Look at me. Look how fucking chill I am. They lose, man. I fucking win. So just relax and take the day off, man. Consider it a present from corporate fucking America. <laughs> the Belco Experiment 2016 Mike Milch, an employee of Belco Industries, is stopped by street vendors while driving to work one day. These vendors are selling lucky handmade dolls. Barry Norris, another member of Belco Industries, arrives at Bogota's remote rural office building to find unfamiliar security guards turning the local Colombian staff away at the main gate. Danny Wilkins, a new employee, reports for her first day of work and learns that a tracking device is implanted in the base of every Belco employee's skull in case they are kidnapped. Even Evan Smith, Belco's head of security, does not know who the new guards are. Once all the employees arrive for work, a voice on the intercom instructs them to carry out an impossible task. Failing to do so will result in consequences. Greg McLean's horror thriller is a grisly, gory exercise in sadism whose venality is camouflaged by a thought experiment plot. He fashions a claustrophobic tale using a group of white-collar employees trapped in their company's high-rise to portray the corporate world being one of murder, quite literally. Besides its intriguing kill-or-be-killed plot, viewers will recognize James Gunn's work who was also the screenwriter for the Guardians of the Galaxy films. 
Incidentally, he first wanted to direct this movie rather than write its screenplay. It begins with a style of darkness which initially pervades into chaos. McLean wanted it to be a bleak treatise of self-preservation as the characters descent into madness. John Gallagher Jr. displays the same sensitivity and down-to-earth likability that can be found in his previous roles. Tony Goldwyn's transition from compassionate boss to a bloodthirsty maniac is truly a sight for a mind-blowing performance. McLean was perhaps determined to leave no cliché unturned in this animal farm meets Texas Chainsaw Massacre climaxed film with some unforgettable twists. What, what are you doing? I'm not doing it! Stop it! Stop it, Jack! <laughs> Ouija, Origin of Evil, 2016. In 1967 Los Angeles, a young widow named Alice Zander works as a spiritual medium. She lives in a suburban home with her children, 15-year-old Paulina and 9-year-old Doris. While the family is still grieving over the death of Alice's husband, Roger, her friend Lena suggests she incorporate a Ouija board into her readings. Alice unknowingly contacts a spirit named Marcus, who begins possessing Doris while she was trying out the board for the first time. When Alice receives a notice that the bank intends to foreclose their home, Doris uses the board for help, believing she will get help from her father. The spirit leads her to a pouch of money behind a basement wall. When they discover the money, the family uses the board, believing they can contact Roger. When the board answers a question that only Roger would know the answer to, Alice is thrilled to think that she is contacting the spirit of her dead husband. Director Mike Flanagan has impressed viewers and reached one step closer to the mainstream with this supernatural horror film. Although it doesn't stretch the conventions of teen appeal too far, it is assembled solidly with a pleasant conviction. Given that the first film in the series was good enough to warrant a sequel, its prospects are certainly looking good. This movie has an understated period setting, which allows the characters to be naive about things that viewers will instantly recognize to be ominous. The main family member's setup allows Flanagan to tackle serious issues like grief, sibling rivalry, and alternate beliefs. Moreover, the house's frictions with women make for dramatics even before the spiritual manifestations escalate to thrilling proportions. Critics claimed that this film has enough material for a season of American Horror Story. The series was developed by Hasbro, the company which spun movie franchises out of Transformers and G.I. Joe licenses. Although the entire film was shot digitally, Flanagan wanted to add a retro spin to it. He added elements like cigarette burn marks that appear every 20 minutes in the upper right corner of the screen, making it look like a movie shot on film. Sinister, 2012. Crime writer Ellison Oswald moves his family into a house where, unbeknownst to them, a horrific crime had taken place earlier. He begins researching the crime in hopes of writing a book about it. Oswald examines video footage that he discovers in the house to help with his research. However, he soon uncovers some things that are more than what he can handle. Sinister is a story comprising of darkness, mysteriously loud bangs in the attic, vulnerable children, and distant moans from the dead. This undeniably frightening film contains performances that add enough human interest to provide depth to the basic building block of horror. It combines true crime sensibilities with paranormal and traditional cinema, while also employing the found footage subgenre. What makes this direction by Scott Derrickson more appealing than other horror films of its decade is a box of cursed videotapes. Although this element alludes to past movies like The Ring, the separate short stories leading into one big mystery is what viewers enjoy the most about this film. Additionally, the combining cinematography of a classic horror film with the realism of found footage gives the audiences more to love. This movie's most commendable aspect is that it successfully scared the wits out of viewers with very little gore, almost no profanity, and no sex. Not to mention, viewers would watch any movie starring Ethan Hawke. Wake up, Sammy. Sammy, wake up. What's wrong, Daddy? 
Dark Skies 2013. Lacey and Daniel live with their sons Jesse and Sammy in a quiet suburban home. Since Daniel is unemployed, supporting the family falls on Lacey, a real estate agent. Suddenly, several strange occurrences begin, such as bizarre rearranging of the utensils at night. When the house alarm goes off, they see that all points of entry were simultaneously breached. Sammy has a fit while playing soccer, and Lacey is shocked to see several birds crashing into the house together. One night, when she hears a noise coming from Sammy's room, she goes to check on him. She is shocked by what she sees. While horror films like The Exorcist and Paranormal Activity keep the supernatural explanation alive in pop culture, the mid-20th century brought with it a steady influx of alien encounter mythology within the horror genre. Scott Stewart borrows heavily from notable supernatural and sci-fi predecessors in this special effects-dependent movie. Many would say that he was attempting to portray a Shyamalan-like game-changing finale in the end. Nevertheless, viewers recognize the change of pace and restraint that he exercised here compared to his previous works. He emphasizes suspense, character, and story in this movie rather than resorting to cheap scares and overuse of CGI animation. Being the first and only choice to play Lucy, Carrie Russell carried the film brilliantly on her shoulders, not to mention her role of being a mother in a family was what attracted her towards it in the first place. Daddy? Fix the lights. <laughs> Oculus, 2013. 21-year-old Timothy Allen Russell is discharged from a mental institution by his psychiatrist, Dr. Sean Graham. It is revealed that he carried a severe childhood trauma. He is welcomed by his sister Kaylee, who takes him home. She mentions that they need to destroy an ancient mirror that she found in the house while clearing it for sale in an auction. When she steals the mirror, Tim follows her and begins having fragmented recollections from when their father bought the mirror for his home office during their childhood. In an alternate timeline in the past, Kaylee sees a strange woman named Marisol in their father's office. Slowly over time, both their parents' behaviors undergo drastic changes that end in a family tragedy. Mike Flanagan's Oculus has been deemed one of the scariest movies to be made in a long time. Although series like Paranormal Activity and The Conjuring excel at the art of jump scares, Oculus evokes a chilling vibe down viewers' spines just by placing two characters in a dark room with an ominous mirror. It relies on the occasional cliches when something materializes right behind an unsuspecting character. However, the specifics in the scene give rise to an innate sense of dread that grows heavier with each unexpected twist. As the film's plot constantly shifts between present-day events and the siblings' childhood experiences, Oculus becomes a compelling allegory representing the lingering trauma of familial dysfunction. The small ensemble cast of Karen Gillan, Brenton Thwaites, and Rory Cochran blend nicely with the sophisticated narrative. The characters' collective fears of the unknown turn a rather basic premise into a sneakily profound reflection on more realistic concerns. Finally, the movie dwells deep into their frightened state and thickens the dreary, dim atmosphere at every turn. The Lazarus Effect 2015 A group of researchers led by Frank and his fiancée Zoe experiment on bringing the dead back to life. After a successful yet unsanctioned trial, the team is ready to unveil their breakthrough to the world. When their university's dean learns of their underground experiments, their project is shut down and materials are confiscated. Frank and Zoe decide to take matters into their own hands. They launch a rogue attempt to recreate their experiment, during which things go south, and Zoe is killed. Fueled by terror and grief, Frank attempts to resurrect her as their first human test subject. Although the procedure appears to be successful at first, the team soon realizes something is wrong with Zoe. As she reveals her strange new persona, they are stuck in a gruesome reality. If viewers think a team of young scientists would know better than to raise a corpse from the dead, they have another thing coming. Even after Hollywood has demonstrated time and again in films like Frankenstein, Pet Cemetery, and Flatliners, the results don't usually turn out well. 
The Lazarus Effect witnesses director David Gelb transition from a documentary to a horror feature filmmaker. He does this with reasonable effectiveness. Nevertheless, viewers familiar with his past work end up chuckling at this film quite a bit. Gelb displays a seemingly sure hand in his debut narrative effort. Although he relies far too much on predictable jump scares and recurring motifs, viewers undergo a thrilling experience while watching this movie. It is an unapologetically quirky modern-day B-movie that breezes by in 83 minutes. It's a compelling and decent acted piece of schlock with sufficient self-awareness to know it will probably not linger in the minds of viewers when the theater lights are back on. Nevertheless, it is one of Blumhouse's underrated pieces of work and deserves more love than it gets. Truth or Dare Olivia, her boyfriend Lucas, and some of their friends, Marky, Penelope, Tyson, and Brad, go on a trip to Rosarito, Mexico. There, Olivia runs into their fellow student, Ronnie, who begins harassing her until a stranger intervenes. He introduces himself as Carter and eventually convinces the entire group to join him for drinks at the ruins of a mansion. He initiates a game of truth or dare with all of them, including Ronnie, who followed them there. Eventually, the game ends when Carter reveals a shocking truth to the group. All they know now is that they must continue playing the game or face terrible consequences. Jeff Wadlow and Blumhouse's Truth or Dare is not just any campy, emotionally involving teen drama. It is a PG-13 rated horror movie where the filmmakers attempt to make the hormonal protagonists look sympathetic enough that viewers care about whether they get impaled or not. Wadlow works with a potentially juicy Final Destination look-alike in which these friends try to cheat death by outsmarting an evil curse that has befallen them. He highlights their primary impulses, which humanize their immature subjects, making them die sadistic yet amusing deaths. It portrays a meaningful backstory. Unlike most archetypes that it's compared to, such as Saw and Final Destination, it uses an interesting idea of using the friends to do the haunting rather than having a separate unknown entity. This enhances its thrill factor. Blumhouse has received huge uproar since producing and distributing Jordan Peele's Get Out. Truth or Dare appears to bear a closer resemblance to the production house's more formulaic horror films. Finally, in the larger scheme of things, Truth or Dare goes back to being a slasher movie whose cruelty only serves as a form of fatherly kindness. Ma, 2019. A lonely woman befriends a group of teenagers and decides to let them party at her house. When the kids think they couldn't get any luckier, certain things start occurring that make them question the woman's intentions. This collaboration between Blumhouse Production and director Tate Taylor is messy in ways both large and small, but ultimately ends up working to the film's benefit. It portrays a set of characters in a small town where everyone knows each other. They express themselves by primarily homophobic insult slurs. Ma presents itself as a time-release take on Carrie, but without the supernatural elements. The main character Sue Ann's kindness and permissiveness expose its creepy edge to viewers long before her teenage guests begin suspecting her. For an actor who establishes depth in roles both large and small, Octavia Spencer takes a chance to get beneath her character's skin, playing a simultaneously insane, justifiably angry, and unnervingly empathetic role. Ma is the second movie directed by Tate Taylor that Octavia Spencer has starred in after The Help. It not only offered her the chance to star in a psychological horror film, but she would also be able to kill people. This is a rare chance that people of color receive in the horror genre. Even though Ma's race isn't explicitly mentioned, it blends itself within the film's themes. What? Outside Careful. Lights. What the hell? Turn the light on. Did he get you? No. Okay. The Gift, 2015. 
Simon and Robin, a young married couple whose life is going just as planned, suddenly encounter an acquaintance from Simon's past. Gordo claims that he and Simon went to high school together, but Simon initially didn't recognize him. However, after a series of uninvited encounters and mysterious gifts, a horrifying secret from their past is uncovered. As Robin learns the unsettling truth between Simon and Gordo, she begins questioning how well she knows her husband and whether he has truly put the past behind him. The Gift, written by Joel Edgerton, in collaboration with Blumhouse Production, uses an incredibly effective script that incorporates just the right dialogues that would be able to drive a wedge between a happily married couple. The fact that a series of nicely wrapped gifts appearing on someone's doorstep can seem ominous is a testament to the film's visual style. The house is lingered over by cinematographer Edward Grau. The camera moves slowly down empty hallways, repeating the shots leaving the rooms unseen in the far end. These stylistic choices set up an expectation within the audience regarding what kind of thriller they are watching. Jason Bateman, who is primarily known for his comedic roles, shifts the focus beautifully as the ambitious Simon who is worried about his wife. He succeeds in appearing both kind and condescending at the same time. Although the gift uses tricks of a thriller well, the central angle that makes it such an intriguing film is how it withholds the necessary information until the very end. This is all the time we had for today's episode. We hope you guys liked it. It would be awesome if you guys can take some time to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to tell us which topic you want us to cover in the comment section. Have a fantastic day ahead and stay safe.